We're going to get started. Okay. <clears throat> Welcome to everyone joining us. My name is Samar Abdel Noor, and I'm joining you from Edinburgh. I will be chairing this event, which is hosted by Friends of the Earth Scotland, the Climate Justice Coalition, and Stop Climate Chaos Scotland. Please note that the event is being recorded. Hence, if you have safety concerns and wish to remain anonymous, please rename yourself. I would also like to draw your attention to the closed captions button and also the Q&A button at the bottom of your screens, which you can use to input questions as they arise. We are joined by two esteemed and knowledgeable guests who I will introduce momentarily. But before I do, I would like to reaffirm that this event is happening in solidarity with an Egyptian civil society call for action to raise awareness and support for Egyptian prisoners of conscience. Climate justice demands guarantees and protections for human rights, including those professed by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, such as Article 9, no one shall be subjected to arbitrary, arbitrary arrest, detention, or exile, and Article 5, no one shall be subjected to torture or cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment. These rights are today systematically denied to tens of thousands of Egyptians, activists, students, teachers, and concerned citizens who, because they dare to express aspiration for a better world and way of life, have been silenced, tortured, and disappeared. COP27 offers but a short window of opportunity to leverage global attention and presence to go beyond simply highlighting the pressing human rights abuses that cage tens of thousands of prisoners of conscience in Egypt and to demand their freedom. It is also a time to recognize that a just transition away from fossil fuels must include a challenge to the brutality, violence, and global inequalities that energy industries have for too long underpinned. Many of us remember that exactly three years ago today, Greta Thunberg led a global climate strike that saw millions of people march in over 150 countries. Yet how many know that at the same moment in time, thousands of Egyptians were arrested, including activist Ala Abed El Fatah. Our first speaker is Omar Robert Hamilton. Omar is a filmmaker and writer and co-founder of the Mosarim Media Collective in Cairo and the Palestine Festival of Literature. In 2017, he published his debut novel, The City Always Wins, which speaks to the achievements and defeats of the Egyptian revolution. Omar joins us from London. Our second speaker is Dipti Batnagar. Dipti is a climate justice coordinator for Friends of the Earth International based in Mozambique. An environmental scientist by training, Dipti is a longtime climate justice activist who has worked with many campaigns and movements, from fighting destructive dam dams to immigrant rights and also access to safe drinking water. Dipti joins us from Maputo. Each will have about 10 minutes to speak, and this will be followed by questions from myself and from you, our audience. We will then close with a number of calls to action, which will be presented by Mary Church, Head of Campaigns for Friends of the Earth Scotland. And with that, I would like to hand it off to Omar, our first speaker. Please go ahead, Omar. <clears throat> thank you, Samer. Um, and yeah, thank you for having me and thank you for everyone who's here. Um, I wanted to start by looking at COP27 and thinking about why it is different than other COPs and how it's being presented differently. And um, Probably the key difference is that because Egypt is the host country, it's being presented as the African COP. And Egypt is trying to position itself as the uh, sort of voice of the global south, that it's going to be playing a negotiating role for the rights of the global south in uh, the future of the energy transition. And because it's the host country, it also gets to set a lot of the terms of negotiations and the, and the, and the focuses of the negotiations. Um, and the two principal ones from what we understand so far will be trying to unlock, um, there was a hundred billion 
dollars a year pledged at Glasgow for climate financing, which has various conditions on it that Egypt wants to try and unlock for global South countries, and taking a lead position on negotiating on loss and damage. And loss and damage is basically the, um, it's like an umbrella term for all of the effects of climate change that are already built in and cannot be undone. So the small island nations that are probably going to go underwater, for example. Um, and Egypt has put a lot of effort over the last few years into building diplomatic and military relations in Africa, principally because it's in a sort of standoff with Ethiopia over the use of the Nile's water. And Ethiopia has been building a very large dam, which Egypt sees as an existential threat. And so Egypt has been working very hard on signing military cooperation deals and training exercises with pretty much every country that rings um, Ethiopia. So they've been very effective and successful diplomatically recently. And, and Sisi, the current president of Egypt, is the sort of the first president of Egypt not to take a sort of sort of racist stance towards the rest of Africa and to sort of say that you know Egypt is not African. Um, and of course, what is needed is a serious global south coalition um, that will negotiate and engage with the energy transition in a way that potentially changes the sort of power dynamics that were established by colonialism and capitalism. But the and Egypt has kind of positioned itself, or Egypt is in a, in a perfect position to play that role. And that is the big PR push that it is making. And that's why, I don't know, I suppose that's, that's, that's the, the big card that it is trying to play. But I think that the reality is that this is all theater from the Egyptians. And that when we look at COP27, when we get ready for it, and as climate activists around the world get ready to engage with it, we have to really recognize why Egypt's positioning is entirely false and um, needs to be challenged and undermined. And I'm gonna run through, yeah, because actually the true issue at the heart of this COP and what people are really gonna be negotiating isn't reparations, but it's gas and um, trying to establish gas as the bridging fuel of the energy transition and um, sort of cementing the fact that it is going to be okay and uh, endorsed for global South countries like Egypt to basically pump and burn all the gas that they have because Egypt has recently discovered major gas fields in the Mediterranean and um, and it intends to utilize them. And Egypt is also not actually driven by global South interests or its power is not a sort of coalition of global South interests at its back, but it is Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, which underwrite it economically, and um, the US, which of course has basically kept, has been, um, Egypt has been the second or the third largest recipient of USA since signing the Camp David peace deal with Israel in the 1970s. So first of all, Egypt is an oil state. It's a gas state. It's the number one um, sector of the economy. And the only sector of the economy that has not been shrinking for the last several years is oil and gas. And it is a client of its regional neighbor oil states. Um, the Sisi regime is entirely underpinned economically by Saudi and the UAE. And it's massively in debt. The foreign debt has been increased by CC from something around 20 billion pounds, 20 billion dollars to I think around 150 billion uh, these days. And um, its debt repayments are basically equivalent to its total GDP at the moment. So it's in a terrible economic position. And, um, and is an authoritarian regime that's wildly unpopular at home that has no functioning political system short of total repression, has no functioning economic system because the economy is tanking and has been consistently tanking for years. Um, and so how can that kind of political entity 
be any kind of legitimate negotiator for global south interests realistically it just can't um, um and these things you know you could say that a lot of these things are things that the cc regime inherited right like camp david was signed in 79 uh there are things that are sort of you know, saudi arabia's oil wealth and hangovers from the cold war these are all predate the cc regime so we can also look at the things that the cc regime have done since they came into power nine years ago or even zoom even further than that we can look specifically at what the cc regime has done to the environmental movement and to the environment the natural environment of egypt again to consider what kind of entity is it that egypt is that uh, is proposing itself as a climate negotiator. So there was a recent report by Human Rights Watch, uh, came out just a few days ago, on the conditions of environmental civil society face in Egypt. Um, they all report a total culture of fear and silence. They all speak to Human Rights Watch on the condition of anonymity. Um, they all report that their work is under terrible pressure from the security services. Um, and there's a good quote here that I wanna to read to you. It says, uh, the government adopts radical discourse when it comes to the global north and its contribution to climate change and carbon emissions just because this intersects with their interests like the need for more funds one person said the report continues but staff members of critical human rights and environmental groups said they are wary of publicly engaging at cop 27 because of fear of reprisals quote the security apparatus will probably now more than ever before focus on environmental civil society in egypt an activist outside the country said when COP ends, they might start looking and see who is doing what, who got funds from where, for example. So the Egyptians are playing a very particular tune, a tune that they've been, I think, advised very carefully on by American PR companies. They've hired two new ones now in the lead up to COP. Um, and they've been very good at using uh, new graduates from like the handful of elite universities that still operate in the country to present a kind of a particular image when addressing a particular part of the world. Um, and COP is sort of the summation of, of several years of, of, of these efforts. And I think we can even look at sort of even beyond uh, their targeting of the environmental activist sector or the general civil society sector or any kind of sector of society that's outside of the regime directly and you can look even at what the regime itself is doing um again reminding that this is the regime that's positioning itself as a climate negotiator so the only as i said the only sector of the economy that's not regularly contracting is oil and gas when cc came to power egypt exported 600 million dollars worth of gas today egypt exports eight billion dollars uh, it still, import, in, still imports coal. They've been cutting down thousands of trees across the country um, in Cairo itself. And anybody that's been to Cairo knows that we don't have that many trees in Cairo to begin with. They cut down 54 football pitches worth of trees in the last two years alone. They've disrupted the flow of the Mediterranean Sea by building a luxury marina um, on the north coast that has now disrupted the way that like the actual sea's patterns move. Uh, they've built 7,000 kilometers of new asphalt roads, even though only 8% of Egyptian families have a car. They've built 900 cement bridges and tunnels. Um, they're pouring absolutely incredible amounts of cement across the country. They're building, I think, at least 12 new cities. Um, there's new Mansour, new Alamein, new Toshka. They're building a vast new administrative capital out in the desert, uh, which is basically to feed a kind of uh, contracting machine and military front companies and to keep, to some extent, to try and keep um, unemployment down a little bit. Um, but of course, this is using masses and masses of water. Um, they're wasting huge amounts of water in desert agribusiness. They're pumping water from the aquifer under the Sahara that takes thousands of years to fill up. And now they're, um, they're pumping it to grow oranges. Uh, Egypt is now the world's number one exporter of oranges, which is basically, you know, you're kind of pretty much exporting water. Um, and, you know, they have installed some solar wind capacity. They've installed a very large solar park in near Aswan, but this was done by a consortium of banks, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. And actually, they recently changed um, the law to change the tax incentives that were in place to try and encourage solar startups because um, they signed the biggest deal ever in the history of Siemens to build three 
combined cycle gas power plants. Um, and so now they have at least $8 billion worth of debt on those gas plants, and they need to make sure that they're selling gas power into the grid. And so they're limiting um, the independent solar sector. So, you know, on all levels, um, we can see that there's really no way that we can think about Egypt as a legitimate climate actor or negotiator going into COP. And, um, you know, there are some arguments made within some parts of the international climate justice movement, I think, that the most important thing is to bring down emissions as quickly as possible and that everything else can come after that, right? And this is the kind of key sort of, I suppose, theoretical or discursive question that, that, that we're facing with this COP. But I don't know, I think it's very clear that well, I'm sure this is what we're going to talk about, really, about why you can't separate human rights from the rights of the planet or environmental rights. Um, and um, yeah, I don't know. Even if, even if, even if Egypt was a good faith actor and was implementing some kind of sort of multi-layered green strategy at home, I, I, we just can't ignore the fact that there's tens of thousands of political prisoners. Um, and yeah, as Sam mentioned, I remember very clearly that the three years ago, the Greta marches, um, and at the same time, yeah, as Sam mentioned, that was when there was a huge sweep going on, where there had been just a handful of small protests in Cairo, actually, in a few cities around Egypt, because there had been revelations about the levels of government corruption. I mean, everybody knew that there was corruption in the government, but a particular contractor who had done a lot of military building came out and started releasing videos saying the actual true depths um, with numbers and details and it sparked off a few protests and in reaction yeah there was a sweep I think they arrested 4,000 people over a number of days including um, and he is um, somebody that yeah I'd like to talk about today as well he because he has a very particular place I think in this question He's a very important writer in Egypt, a uh, democracy activist. I'm the editor of his translated works that was published um, recently. And um, he's also a British citizen. And so there's something very particular happening here where obviously last year, COP was in Glasgow. And so the presidency is being handed from Britain to Egypt. And within all of this, um, I think it's really important to keep in mind that while the Brits are handing over this presidency to, to the Egyptians, there is a British citizen in prison in Egypt, um, and the Brits have not even been allowed to have consular access to him. And he's been on hunger strike now for 179 days, and one of his two demands was access from the British embassy, which has not happened. Um, and yeah, his name is, yeah, I don't know, his name is up there, there has been a lot of already, there have been already some good numbers of international calls about the kinds of things that we're going to be talking about today, about how, even though there's been histories of greenwashing in COP, that this is the first COP that is going to be actually kind of whitewashing massive human rights abuses, because this is going to be a big PR victory for the Egyptian regime. And, um, And yeah, I mean, I don't know. How am I doing on time, Sam? I have meant to put the time on my phone and I forgot. I put mine. Um, yeah. I mean, feel free to wrap up whenever you're comfortable and then... Yeah, we'll I mean, we're going to come back to this in the questions. Um, but yeah, I just think that's important to keep in mind that, yeah, the, 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 the division between the idea of climate justice and human justice is... It's really an untenable division and anybody that's trying to make it is really dodging the essential question of like, how have we got to this position with a heating planet? Like it's not. And if you don't look at human justice, then you don't get to the root causes of that. You don't get to the effects of capitalism or polluting corporations and you don't get to the future that we're trying to get to, right? Which is. Um, Which is not about it's not about everybody driving a Tesla, right? And just forgetting about where the battery comes from. It's about rethinking how life works and having a structure of life that's based around public transport and public utilities and public good. Um, and yeah, any kind of attempt at dividing climate justice from human rights, I think, is 
ultimately siding with um, the forces that have got us to where we are right now. Uh, so I'll stop there and I'm sure we'll come back to this some things. Thank you so much, Omar. Um, you know, I have many questions I'd like to ask, but I will wait uh, and then invite our next speaker, Dipti, to take the floor. Dipti, whenever you're ready, please. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, greetings coming to you from Mozambique and especially to those of us, those of you who have joined us from Egypt. Um, I would really like to understand how we can be in solidarity with you over these coming months, but of course also longer because of patterns that are happening on the continent. I'll talk a little bit about that. We have been in touch with Egyptian organizations. I am not going to name any of them here or any of the people, but we, I would really appreciate opening this space to figure out how can we work together and be in solidarity. But I wanted to start really centering the idea of no climate justice without open civic space. I think this is a really important point. So what is climate justice? Why do we call ourselves climate justice activists? We understand that the climate crisis is inherently unjust because it impacts most those who did the least to create this crisis. So the people in the global north who are the ones who who, who are the ones mostly responsible for creating the crisis and using fossil fuels to build up also their societies and their economies. And the ones who are facing the impacts the most are the people in the global south, the poorest and the most marginalized people on this planet. And that's who we need to center in any kind of decisions that we make, any kind of work that we do on climate justice. It's not, clim climate change is not a technical issue or a science issue. We see it as very much as a justice issue and that's why the intersection with human rights is absolutely critical because these are actual human beings who are already affected by the impacts of climate change. This is about this is about people on rooftops, right? As the water rises, whether it's central Mozambique when Cyclone Idai hit, whether it's Puerto Rico right now, whether it's Florida, it's happening in the global north, it's happening in the global south, the floods in Pakistan. This is about us imagining and centering those individuals waiting on rooftops as the water is rising and they have no idea what is going to happen to them, whether they're going to see their loved ones. These are the people that we need to be centering in anything that we do about climate justice. Because this is also about, and, and um, Omar talked about that already, this is about 500 years of genocide and slavery and colonialism. And we need to understand that history and we need to ground ourselves in that history because that is what has brought us to this point. The climate crisis did not happen by accident. It didn't, it's, it's not just a byproduct of everything else that's happening all the other inequalities, all the other crises that are going on, the biodiversity crisis, the inequality crisis, the health crises, they're all linked to the climate crisis. So we talk about the multiple interrelated crises. And that's why we need to center human rights and justice in everything that we do. Coming to the issue of the shrinking space for civil society, one of the other crises we're seeing right now is a democratic crisis. We all have seen what has happened in Italy and Sweden just over the last few days, the sort of right-wing governments that for some reason people are feeling like these are the, the, the strong men who are going to take care of us. They are the ones who are gonna build the walls and keep everyone else out. So let's, you know, let's vote for them. And the whole question of democracy and what that is looking like in so many places when we have these sort of political crises, that's something that though, though that's part of the crisis that we're facing and we need to we need to consider the shrinking of civil space along with the climate crisis and along with these these democratic these crises of democracy that we're facing very interestingly omar talked about gas and how this cop is being set up as the gas cop at the one where you know, Africa is going to say, hey, we need space. We need space for our right to development. What is going to happen to our right to development? So give us the, the atmospheric space, give us the environmental space to continue on the path of fossil fuels. And we as African citizens need to get together and say no. Here in Mozambique, 
One of the largest gas fields that has been found anywhere in the world in the last 10 years has been found off the coast of Northern Mozambique. And it is playing out exactly as you would expect. The resource curse scenario, the conflict, the insurgency, the militarization, which is happening here, the increase of debt, the, the increased indebtedness, all of that is playing out. And we need to push back very seriously. And we're already doing that. So many of us who are here on this call and so many outside saying, this COP is not going to be allowed to be used as an excuse for pushing forward this gas narrative. Of course, coming very conveniently in, and you know, with, with the Russian in, with the unjust Russian invasion of Ukraine, the mass came off from the European countries. Uh, earlier it was okay, okay, Africa needs gas for its own needs. Africa needs gas to develop. Now it's very clear that it was never ever meant for Africa's development. It was always meant for Europe. It was always meant for export, also for also for the emerging economies of, of Asia. And I'm born and raised in India myself. So the mass came off, right? None of that was ever supposed to be for Africa or for African people's development. So pushing back on gas at this particular COP is really going to be important. I want to make a link to going back to the issue of the shrinking civil society space, friends. What Egypt is showing us today is happening in other parts of Africa as well here in Mozambique. We have three laws that have recently been passed, an anti-terrorism law, a law against money laundering, and most recently a law about how NGOs and associations are supposed to behave. And all of this is intended to shrink the civil society space, to control our actions. We need to get approval from the government for our activities under this law, if it finally approves the last step the way that it's written right now, many of our organizations are going to be extinguished. And that's exactly the point. And it's not just Mozambique. Egypt is already from what Omar was saying and, and what has been happening to journalists and, and human rights defenders and students and teachers in Egypt. It's showing us where many of our own countries are headed, Ethiopia, Zimbabwe, others who have had these kinds of laws proposed, Angola, now Mozambique is in that list and we are pushing back whatever we can do at the national level, but there is work that needs to be done at an African level saying, I'm sorry, the governments of Africa may be getting together and, and plotting about how they're going to, to shrink the civil society space and squash all of the civil society in their countries. But we civil society are gonna to get together and be in solidarity with each other and push back on all of this where it is already happening like in Egypt and where it is it is imminent like in places like Mozambique. So this is a really important point because this is how power operates. We know that those in power are going to abuse it. We need to be setting up our accountability systems. We need to be setting up our transparency systems so that whoever is in power is going to be accountable to the people that elected them and not to the polluters. We want, we want our leaders to be accountable to us, not to the polluters, which means we need to have a robust civil society. We need to be able to fight for that space. So understanding from here on for the next few months, so Friends of the Earth International does use the COP space as one of the arenas of struggle, not the only one, but we do use that as an arena of struggle to be there, not to pretend like it's actually going to change things because that space has repeatedly failed people from the global south, especially Africans, repeatedly failed. In 2009, the negotiator from Africa, Lumumba Diaping, said that two degrees average temperature rise would be a suicide pact for Africa. And we're pretty much heading there. So the, that space has constantly failed people and planet, but we will continue to use it to hold those in power accountable for their crimes and show them a mirror for what they're doing. But at the same time, it's one arena of struggle. We also are organizing on the ground. So along with the Africa Climate Justice Conveners Group, we're organizing something called the Africa People's Counter Cop, which is happening the week of the 17th of October. And people are organizing 
in their own places, not getting everyone together in their own places, wherever people are fighting dirty energy, fighting the impacts of climate change, fighting against false solutions, net zero, all of those schemes that are only intended to allow polluters to continue polluting. Wherever people are fighting against these, they're organizing in their places to build power on the ground because eventually that is what is going to, that is what is going to empower communities and connect us all and to be able to fight back, we need to build power on the ground. So we need to have this strategy of building at using every arena of struggle, whoever's going to the COP, let's go there, let's try and challenge whatever that we can. And let's also be in solidarity and let's also build on the ground wherever possible, as much as possible. I'll stop by saying that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change which has produced reports for 30 years. This year in February, when they released their impacts report, which was completely overshadowed by the unjust Russian invasion of Ukraine, it happened at the same time. For the very first time in 30 years, they put the word colonialism into the report, talking about the impacts of climate change. The, this is be, the, the systemic nature of the crisis is being recognized even by though we recognized it a long time ago, isn't it folks? It's even being recognized by these kinds of bodies and we need to be able to use that to understand history and build in the future and build power so that we can really challenge this shrinking civil society space and challenge the multiple interrelated crises that people are facing. I'll stop there, thanks. Thanks, Summer, back to you. Thank you so much, Dipti. Uh, and also uh, to Omar, uh, both of you have painted uh, a comprehensive and if I may, a, a difficult uh, picture to swallow in some uh, regards, especially given um, what is evident, which will be a huge push to legitimate gas and gas that is likely to be uh, exported um, to help uh, or, or to be used to alleviate some of the financial pressures that Egypt is doing and, um, and that benefit will likely entrench many of the authoritarian um, uh, practices and the human rights abuses that we're speaking about. Uh, Dipti, also you've spoken about uh, the shrinking civil society space. We also seeing that somewhat in the UK. Um, just last week in The Guardian, it was reported that climate activists are being held in prison for upwards of six months while waiting trial. And this, along with um, attempts to restrict the ability of citizens to, uh, to protest. Um, so I have a couple of questions I'd like to begin with. And then there are a number of uh, questions from the audience. I would like to remind those in the audience, if you would like to ask questions, please use the Q&A function. There is a bottom, um, there's a button, sorry, at the bottom of your screens. Please put your questions in there. So I'll start with a couple of pointed questions. So there are many climate campaigners and even some policymakers who are questioning whether or not they should even attend COP27 given human rights abuses, um, uh, given the not just the greenwashing but the possibility for whitewashing and the implications of their own participation in terms of normalizing violence. Um, and they're wondering, uh, whether or not their partition their partition might uh, even um, uh, whether or not they could even create leverage for some type of positive change, and I would wondering to I'm curious mm. to hear from either of you or from both of you um, what your position is on on that. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean it's a tricky it's a tricky one because COP is happening and. Um, I think in the in the coming weeks there will be increasing scrutiny on Egypt, both in the media and well, sort of just globally. And I think that hesitation that people are feeling needs to be used now. And I think that if there are organizations or people who are questioning whether or not they should be going, they need to be communicating those doubts in ways that ultimately reach um, the Egyptians, right? So who are we talking to? We're talking to our institutions, talking to climate envoys, you're talking to the kinds of people that communicate with Alok Sharma, with John Kerry, 
because I think what we've seen is there's a pretty unified call from both inside Egypt and from several dozen international human rights groups saying um, if Egypt wants to be taken seriously in this role that it's trying to play, that it needs to have a full prisoner amnesty of all prisoners of conscience. And we don't even know how many there are, but there are tens of thousands. And this is the, the low, this is the minimum, you know, and there is, so if Egypt were to actually release everyone who is in prison, not for a violent crime, but for expressing their opinion one way or another, then this would be a signal that actually, you know, that some corner is being turned, that there is some interest from the regime in living up to, I don't know, some fraction of the, of the idea of itself that is presenting to the world. And yeah, so I think that is the demand. And I think that should be communicated through whatever channels um, there are to communicate to. And that should be done as urgently as possible because the pressure would be now. Once COP begins, the pressure pretty much dissipates. Um, so that's the level of, that's what people are organizing to try and to try and get as a, as a yeah, that's what people are trying to get out of the Egyptians in the, in the lead up. Thank you. Dipti? Um, <clears throat> thanks for the question. I think it's really important to be guided by progressive organizations within Egypt on this question. And from what I understand, in my very, very limited understanding, is that there is exactly as Omar was saying, because there are possibilities to use the, the spot light on Egypt as an opportunity to get some justice and human rights for some very specific people, for prisoners of conscience, for people who are being held without the right conditions. If that, I, I feel like from what I've heard from Egyptian organizations, they think it is a good mo moment to do that because the COP is happening in any case. Let's put the focus and let's try and use it as an opportunity to get whatever justice that we can. Whether or not the COP is going to deliver justice at all is a completely separate question. As I said, it's one of the arenas of struggle. We, we need to be there. It's not the first time or the last time that the COP is held in a place that is going to make us cringe. And in general, I think civil society and the COP27 coalition is trying to, as part of its demands for this COP, is trying to say that we need to revitalize the relationship that civil society actually has with the COP space because our, our space and civil society within the COPs, even that has been shrinking. O overall, it's been shrinking, but within the, within the COP space, it's been shrinking in terms of what can we do, how many actions we can do, et cetera. So it's, go it's, it's going to be a long journey for, for the work that we need to do in terms of pushing for justice. And if we are to use every avenue possible, and if progressive Egyptian organizations agree with us that we can be there and be in solidarity with them, then for sure, we should definitely do that. And just a quick note, when I say progressive Egyptian organizations, I'm separating that from Gongo's government organizations because we know that exists. And how do we know? Because we have that very much here in Mozambique as well. We understand how structures of power operate. We understand how governments create NGOs to be able to, you know, to, to fill the role of civil society and, and marginalize other progressive organizations. So understanding all of these dynamics and understanding what is happening in Egypt is absolutely critical, but also seeing that these are patterns that are happening all across this continent and in other places, somewhere, as you said, and making those links makes us stronger. Yeah, I think a logistical point is um, there's a good website called copcivicspace.net, which Mary's put in the chat here. And so that's the new website that was launched by a coalition of Egyptian groups. And um, so that's something that you can sign up to, you can follow their updates. And it's a way I think of them getting connected to them. If we get to the point where COP's happening and there are thoughts about what to do actually on the ground in Sharm, then that would be a way of being connected to a, a good source point of, of, of calls coming out of Egypt. I'd like to um, ask a, another question and it also relates uh, somewhat to one of the questions in the Q&A. The, the question in the Q&A asks about the, um, the role of Egyptian youth in participating in COP, but I'd like to expand that more broadly. 
what's the likelihood and what are what will it look like for um egyptian like local uh, or 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 national uh, egyptian organizations and their ability to um to participate uh, what are the kind of uh, opportunities what are the limitations what are the what are the concerns um and what's the what will likely be the reality of their capacity to actually meaningfully engage during COP. Yeah, well, I mean, as Dipti was saying, they 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 do there have been several, you know, NGO type bodies that have been created by the state or a state affiliated. Um and the regime has put a lot of effort into doing youth conferences in the last few years. It's one of the few things that it actually knows how to deliver for some reason. They have these youth conferences that happen in Sharm Sheikh. And so they're quite good at presenting something that looks like civil society, but is sort of totally hollow and regime aligned. So those will be the people that will be front and center. And then it's important to bear in mind the geography of where this is happening. So Sharm el-Sheikh is a coastal resort town at the very southern tip of the Sinai Peninsula. It's actually surrounded by a wall. So if you were to get there as an Egyptian, you have to first of all drive north and then go through a tunnel into Sinai. And that tunnel is a very easy control point where everybody is checked. And so there's not going to be any kind of organic local um, civil society present there. There might be some people managed to get in, but 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 what you'll be being presented with will be totally theatrical. Um, so yeah. Okay, thanks. And the, the so <laughs> so you've in in both of those answers, um, um, Omar and and also Dipti, you've spoken a bit to what can happen in the lead up to COP, but also what is likely to happen during COP, but it was also hinted, uh, Omar, that what happens after is also going to be really important and there are possible consequences for uh, activists um, and climate justice activists, human rights activists, who do uh, speak up and draw attention during COP. So I'm wondering if, if you know, what are some of the things we need to think through now to yeah. be prepared for what happens after COP. Uh, Dipti, do you have thoughts? This is a tricky question. Um, so the two aspects, right? One is on the issue of climate justice. Nothing is going to be sorted at this COP. If, if, if anything, the situation is going to be worse. So we need to continue our fight. We need to rally our progressive forces and we need to fight back against against what we are, you know, on what we are against, dirty energy, false solutions, et cetera. And we need to be constantly putting out our vision of what is the world that we want to see. We need to be able to, to envision that. We need to be able to talk about it. And then I think solidarity is something that's going to be really important. For us, we don't have a Friends of the Earth group in Egypt. We, Friends of the Earth is a, is a network, um, is a federation of seven members in 73 countries but not in Egypt. So I am not able to very directly, uh, we have allies in Egypt, but, but I won't be able to say what exactly we should do in Egypt afterwards. But I think in general, it's really important to, for us to understand that us as foreigners, there, there will be such a focus on Egypt during the COP, they're not going to do anything about us foreigners. They're, 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 they're not going to be a mass arresting foreigners, at least I don't think so. If someone else knows other, let us all know. But we are extremely worried about what will happen to Egyptian allies once we leave. And which is why for me, for Friends of the Earth, we are, we are evolving our guidance of what we are saying to our federation, to, to the people who are going to be part of our delegation. But it needs to be clear that do not speak about Egyptian organizations or Egy Egyptian individuals without having it cleared from the people that we are working with so that we do not endanger every and anyone. So that is going to be some very clear guidance. And we actually want to open up this dialogue to hear from people what is it that we could be doing besides educating people. So there's an interesting question in the chat about there's going to be so many young people from Africa, from everywhere who are going to go to COP. 
without having any understanding about what is happening with the human rights issues. And that is why an, uh, an event like this, this week of solidarity is so critical. And that's the work I feel like I'm, I'm trying to do and Friends of the Earth is trying to do every space possible where we talk about COP, we are talking about what is happening there and saying this, we, we need to be very mindful about the human rights issues in Egypt and not go in without knowing the context of what our colleagues may be facing. And we need to really think about and understand what solidarity looks like in this very particular situation. So that's what we are trying to do in the lead up to COP is make sure as many people as possible who are going know what is happening. What is going to happen after the COP, we also want to be in conversation with progressive Egyptian activists and figure out what would be the best way ahead. How And, and also this is about larger patterns about what is happening in other places. So. How can we be in solidarity with you and how can we learn from your experiences because this is happening in our countries too so there are various levels of i think the work that needs to continue long after this cop is done i want to just build on that for a moment and bring it back to the question of prisoners um so we've you know we've we've spoken about um or we've we've heard from both of you about that um, about you know organizing and coalitions with local organizers and Omar has spoken a little bit about you know sending signals, but you know what you know we've come together today um, in response to uh, a call uh, for solidarity with Egyptian prisoners of conscience. How can we ensure? that this call and this demand is um, more central, more front, uh, you know, more front and center, more on the minds and the tongues of um, the people who are taking decision. And also that when COP is done, that this specific message that, that, um, that the question of prisoners isn't lost to other uh, concerns or, um, you know, the focus on, on COP28, for instance. Yeah, I mean, it's obviously, I, I, I really hate um, awareness as an answer. And I think we've seen in particular, like in the last sort of 10 years, now that we all have the internet, that like awareness on its own doesn't do anything. But um, Egypt is a bit of a strange case where on the one, it sort of has both a sort of bad reputation, but also nobody cares and people still think it's sort of a normal country. Um, and it's a sort of finely balanced PR act that it does in the outside world. Um, but I do think that it is ultimately susceptible to um, its reputation on the global stage because it's so dependent on the outside world for either loans or, um, or of course, tourism. So there is a sensitivity in the country and I do think that um, the more that Egypt feels that it is paying reputational costs for um, you know it's basically sort of total intolerance for any kind of dissent or difference of opinion and then yeah then there are ways of of, of making it hopefully pay some sort of small price for not at all, for, 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 for the number of prisoners that it's keeping. Um, but it's tricky, you know, in the end, we don't have very much power. In the end, like Egypt has managed to cement its position as a sort of authoritarian regime. It's managed to play a smart geopolitical game where before it was really dependent on Washington to now having backers um, in France and Saudi and UAE and Germany and previously Russia, but you know not so much now. Um, so they are very very savvy operators, and they have been able to get away with a tremendous amount of injustice and violence over the last ten years, which makes it very hard to answer in any kind of positive or optimistic way about them. Um, short of hoping that perhaps this moment of intense focus could be some sort of watermark for, for them where afterwards you know 
the world's understanding or picture of Egypt has changed to such a degree that they might actually need to check themselves and and um, and slightly change course. But it's it's very hard to see because you know once you establish a regime that totally depends on prison to maintain itself and prison is the answer to every kind of challenge that comes at it, then it is very, very difficult for it to undo that and to change course, but it's not impossible. Um, and yeah, again, that's one of the nice things about Alet, the writer that we mentioned at the beginning is that, you know, you can see in his books or in his book, in his later essays, that even when he's been in prison for two and a half years and he has been denied a pen or a paper and he's been kept in a dungeon for two years, he kind of invents this new mode of like communication where he's been, gets every once in a while summoned to the prosecutor to give a statement and they don't expect him to actually say anything, but he kind of gives these long detailed um, analyses of the state and, and the ways in which that even a state that has become so totally sort of carceral centric as Egypt could actually find ways to slightly adjust its own course. So it's not impossible, but but it requires a level of persistence and focus from the outside world that the media cycle doesn't lend itself to, and certainly the social media cycle doesn't lend itself to. They're very, very good at holding firm and doing things slowly and um, stubbornly. And I guess that just has to be matched by the outside. Thank you for that, Omar. Um, there's um, there's a question in the chat that I'd like to pick up on, and I might um, just link it to a comment you brought up in your presentation about the you know weddedness of Egypt to gas and its regional uh, relations, the geo geopolitics uh, of the region. And in you painted a, a kind of a, a grim picture in the sense of those of us who would like to see a transition away from fossil fuels are up for uh, quite a challenge, uh, given Egypt will at least see itself as continuing to be dependent and other countries will look to Egypt um, as an exporter of gas. Um, but what does this mean for uh, you've, we've spoken a bit about what it might mean for COP27, but given COP28 then moves and stays in the Gulf, or will move to the Gulf uh, in Dubai, what does it mean um, for um, COP, and I mean, I guess this also opens to, to Dipti as well for both, but what does it mean for some of these dynamics about the resource dependencies on fossil fuels, about regional power dynamics, um, and also for the capacity of the international community to actually intervene in a meaningful way. Um, so it's also about taking the kind of framework you've laid, um, but recognizing that we move on um, and we stay in the Gulf uh, or we, we move to the Gulf region uh, where there are you know, slightly different but similar kind of resource dynamics that are happening um, regionally. So I guess I'll open that up to both of you. Maybe Dipti, if you'd like to begin, I see you nodding. And <clears throat> go to Omar. Sure. There, there's a few questions about that, and of course, it, it's the the COP is going to the to the United Arab Emirates next. Uh, definitely no beacon beacon of human rights. Um, I think it goes back to something, Summer, you said in the very beginning, which is about urgency versus justice. And it's extremely problematic that this is how it gets framed, right? It's urgency versus justice. And, and for us, I think it really goes back to the road is long and the road goes through COP27, COP28 and far beyond. And it's not just going through the COPs. It's really about building power on the ground as well, because urgency is important because people are facing impacts today and they've already been facing impacts for many, many years, not to mention the systemic impacts of the crisis that, they've, that people have faced for 500 years. But the it, urgency is a factor 
the, the, the hurricane is hitting Puerto Rico now, the next cyclone is building up in the, the channel of Mozambique now. Urgency is definitely important because who is going to pay the cost? It's those who didn't create the crisis. But at the same time, if we don't talk about the multiple interrelated crises, if we allow them to say that climate change is the only important thing, then they'll say, okay, we're gonna throw the book at it. We're going to do whatever we can to stop that crisis, which means false solutions, which means geoengineering. So we, we can't, we really need to guard against that and say the transition needs to be urgent, but it needs to be just and equitable and feminist at the same time. So that's why, it is really important to, to, to use this COP to do whatever we can to challenge the forces of power. And we'll probably do the same in the next COP as well, you know, even though the, the circumstances of where it is are going to be hard. But we know that that is one of the spaces that we are using to fight back. And we are continuing to use all the other spaces and build power and build solidarity between people facing these issues all over the world. I mean, talking about Dubai and how migrant workers are, are treated there could be something, whatever we are talking about Egypt now, and not to remove the focus from Egypt because this is absolutely critical. And this is the period, what you were saying about prisoners, when Global North governments, Janet asked the question in the chat, Global North governments need to be forced at the moment to make sure that Egyptian prisoners are released before COP, use this as a moment to do that. And then we're going to bring in the human rights and center justice in the next COP as well and talk about migrant issues and how that is linked to the heart of the climate crisis because climate change means that migration is going to happen much, much more. And some people are going to create walls and we need to we need to push back on that. And we need to be talking about migrant justice and we need to be talking about solidarity. So I think as long as we center ourselves in the most important, this needs to be a values driven conversation. This isn't about, you know, cop hopping. This isn't about going to cop or not going to cop. There was a question about that as well. My point is, if you're going to COP this year, do it fully knowing and understanding what people are facing there and do it with a feeling of solidarity with them. You don't want to go to COP, don't go to COP. That is just as good of a decision. Use your time to build power somewhere on the ground that is going to drive the transition. That's perfect. We're going to build our movement bit by bit, just like that, I feel like. Yeah, I mean, I'd add to that, I guess that, um, I guess it's a good sort of summation of the limitations and the problems of the nation states and states being the principal actors at COPS. Um, um, I think it also, COPS are taking up a lot of headspace right now, but like, what were the COPS between Paris and Glasgow? Can people name them like i think because it's egypt it's attracting this particular kind of attention and then dubai again because of, you know these are two oil and gas states but you know in the end in the 27 years since cop has been going more emissions have gone into the air than in the entirety of human history before cops so you know there's a limitation obviously in the structure of these nation states that were all kind of constructed in the history of capitalist colonialism that has led us to this point so you know there is an inherent problem in the negotiating body sort of like needing to negotiate themselves out of existence if we really are serious about arriving at a, at a just future right so you know maybe we need to just also think more outside of the cop box and like what are the things that actually lead to the kinds of you know what is the energy transition right like in the in the in the last few years we've really seen um the full kind of force of like the major institutions of the world really get behind like the concepts of the energy transition like three or four years ago there still felt like there was some kind of like liberatory potential in solar power or wind power but it's just clear now that this is now going to be driven by bp and by the banks and by the america and china and you know the cc regime or whatever so and their drive is just to substitute the fuel that drives our world into the, the, a different kind of fuel that maintains exactly the same world. And 
COP has sort of become like a mechanism for that particular transition, right? It's not really about changing the world. It's just about changing the energy systems that underpin this world. Um, and so, yeah, just going from Egypt to Dubai is only going to solidify that uh, that kind of raison d'etre that they've taken on, I suppose. Thanks, Omar. I think, and that point that you've just made, you it's it's captured in some of your um, in some of the writings that I've read that you put out there in, in, in Madam Masar uh, that raise questions around um, the, you know, an, an energy transition simply moving away from fossil fuels without challenging um, uh, power relations and, and, and even colonial power relations um, will simply swap one, as you've said, one mode of energy for another while maintaining systems of power, uh, including uh, authori authoritarian governments and uh, and the abuses that go along with it. I think um, the two of you have also shed light on and a couple of questions that have popped up in the chat about you know some of the language that we use between the global south and north, and also um, uh, Omar, you've touched on the way in which you know attention. In um, in Egypt, but also in in the upcoming COP in UA, raises a, a whole set of concerns around issues of human rights, and often those conversations are absent uh, when COP is in uh, based in kind of Western context. Even though uh, you know, if we look at the human rights abuses and the and the perpetual wars and warfare that um, and and war crimes that. Um, you know, EU nations uh, or or Western nations, the UK as well, participate in. And so, there's still sometimes in the in the conversations that we do have. Um, I think we should also be careful um, around that. And some of the people in, in the audience have put that um, to play. I've uh, there there are many great questions that have popped up in in the Q and A. We've answered through the conversation a, a large number of them. I would like to give each of you an opportunity just for a, a kind of a final point. Um, and ag again, um, you know, if we can think through specifically, you know, what, again, what people can do in reaction and in solidarity um, with uh, prisoners of conscience. Uh, even if you're reiterating a point that you've already made, please go ahead. But just to keep in line with the kind of uh, ethos of our meeting today, if we can have a, a final comment from each of you, and then I'll um, pass it on to uh, to Mary Church, head of campaigns for Friends of the Earth Scotland, for some um, for sharing uh, a number of actions that uh, people in our audience can engage uh, before, during, and also hopefully after COP. So uh, please, Dipti, would you like to uh, start and then we'll leave it to Omar and then I'll pass it on to Mary. Uh, thanks. I've, I've been looking at the questions. It's really, um, you know, fascinating. This conversation could go on a lot longer, but I think that is exactly the point. Um, I think Zoom has brought us together like never before, this ability for us to have conversations. And I think this is what is important because as someone said, what is really at the heart of all of this happening is the lack of democracy. And, and that's what it is. For me, it goes back to that very slogan, which is on the site of the COP civic space, no climate justice without open civic space. We've got a flag, which is no climate justice without gender justice, no climate justice without racial justice. And I think it's really important to add this, no climate justice without open civic space. And it goes to the heart of the issue of understanding how power operates at every single level, how so many of our post-colonial countries also went down the exact same unjust route. This is how power operates which means we need to have systems of accountability for whoever is pretending to recognize, you know, to, to represent us. And we need to have that civic space and we need to have that democracy, however we define it in different places. 
but we need to be pushing back against this right wing attack like this is a symbol of you know how the right wing is connected how modi and bolsonaro and trump are talking to each other we need to be in solidarity with uh, with each other learning that what is happening in egypt today is going to happen in mozambique and, and zimbabwe and ethiopia tomorrow and and using our collective strength building power on the ground and using our values based networks to say hey we understand what each other is going through your struggle is my struggle my struggle is your struggle and use that to push back it's the only thing that we can do right now i feel like we need to do we need to use all this all the spaces all the ways available to us awareness raising yes it doesn't sound like a lot but the more people who know what is going on the more people who are informed about what is going on that it isn't just about an urgent transition it's about a just transition the more people who understand that we need we need system change this we need an energy system change we need an economic system change but we need a value system change and and in southern africa we talk about ubuntu which is i am because we are this is the level of human interconnectedness that we really need to be talking about and centering in all of our work and i feel like that is the way ahead at least at least for me thank you thank you deputy omar yeah thank you deputy um i just saw that all these questions actually i was looking at the open section of this so there was someone asked um how did egypt come to host cops so i just answer quickly it's because i think it was africa's turn and so egypt because it's in a very strong position within the african union managed to lobby within the union to host it and someone else asked about wind on the red sea and there is a bit of wind on the red sea but not that much but yeah there could certainly be more but they you know they like to talk about kite surfing instead um so yeah i don't know closing point what to do for me i suppose yeah, I'm going to bring it back to the one thing that I think we really can do and that really would matter is we can get Ala Abdel Fattah out of prison. And I think that would really matter. And it will matter because he is a symbolic prisoner. He's a, regi he's a prisoner that the regime has made into a symbol. You know, he was a youth leader. He was big on Twitter. He wrote pieces in, in newspapers. But then the regime has basically kept him in prison more or less since 2013, and they have built him up into their key symbolic prisoner with which they communicate to the country that the revolution is over and crushed and you, the youth, are finished and forget about any other future than the one that we are building in cement around you. So he is somebody that holds a very large place within the regime's imagination, I think within Egypt's imagination, within the region's imagination, and I think if he was to be got out, I think it would be a very important victory for democracy, and I think it's the kind of um, thing that would have very serious, positive, long-term effects. And it's an individual, he's like a, you know, it's, it would unlock a lot. And it's doable because, as I said at the beginning, because he is British, his mother was born in Britain in 56. And so while he was in prison, he managed to acquire British citizenship, which basically opened up a whole new realm of political campaigning that's possible. And uh, we've been working very, very hard in Britain to raise his case and have had attention of different parts of the government and Boris Johnson raised it twice. And um, we need for Liz Truss and for James Cleverly to believe that this is an important thing for them to focus on, that it's something that they need to deliver, that if COP is to go ahead as it is, if one of them is to go, um, they need to not go and not come back with their citizen with them um and i think if we can get him out then a lot of good things will follow in egypt and in the region um and i so that is the one achievable that i'm personally very focused on and i think there are all kinds of ways for other people to join in on that and there's a website of freealet.net um which i'd recommend people check out and also definitely also please look at copcivicspace.net um, and I think those are the two good resources for um, the coming few weeks and for ways that everybody out there can can genuinely like get involved in things. Omar, uh, thank you so much. Dipti, thank you so much. Um, and thank you for sharing your, um, your knowledge, your ideas, uh, your wisdom and uh, and your strategies.
with us today. Uh, I would like to now ask uh, Mary Church, who is the head of campaigns for Friends of the Earth Scotland, to join. Uh, Mary, as I understand it, is going to give um, a bit of an overview of different campaigns and actions that people can take, tangible campaigns and actions that people can join and, and take uh, in the lead up to and also during and, and, and stay connected with after COP. Uh, Mary, please go ahead. Thanks, Summer. Um, I am just going to rattle through because there are a whole, there's a long list of um, things that people can do um, to take action. And Becky will be posting the details and the links and the websites and everything in the chat as I go. So don't worry if you don't catch everything um, that I say. And some of what I say will also be um, uh, capturing what our speakers have already contributed in terms of um, the, the important solidarity actions we can um, take. So first off, just to reiterate that the Egyptian Human Rights Coalition on COP27 have launched this petition demanding the opening up of civic space in Egypt and the immediate and unconditional release of all those who have been arbitrarily detained for exercising their rights to freedom of expression, peaceful assembly and association. So please sign this petition um, and share this petition with your networks. The same coalition is also calling for um, actions in solidarity. Uh, so through organizing events like this, and this is during a, a particular week of action, but don't let it stop you that, you know, when this week is over, please continue to organize events like this, protests in front of Egyptian um, embassies, um, and also log onto their website to support their online campaigning. This is also the place to go to for reactive calls for solidarity or action following the anticipated reprisals in Egypt during or after COP27. Um, we would also, uh, picking up on, on, on Omar's, um, uh, 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 what Omar shared about um, Allah Abdel Fattah, um, mm -hmm. we would really encourage you to um, visit uh, freeallah.net where you can send a letter to your MP, you can follow the campaign on social media and you can look out for upcoming actions of which there will be many things um, planned, I think in London and elsewhere um, that you can join in with from mid-October um, and up to and during um, COP. Also on the three year anniversary of um, Allah's latest arrest and also the arrest of the Egyptian human rights lawyer, Mohammed al Bakr. Um, a global coalition of civil society organizations have come together to demand that Egyptian authorities uh, for their immediate release. So you can support this, um, uh, this call for action by signing on to a joint statement. I understand that that is open to both individuals and to organizations. Um, Becky has posted the, the form to sign up to that in the chat just now. The deadline for signing on to that is the 28th of September. Dipti also mentioned earlier that the African People's Counter COP is being organized uh, from the 17th to the 21st of October. There will be hybrid events and decentralized actions. The program for that is not completely finalized as I understand, but again, we're sharing in the link, um, the chat to the website where you can follow for more information as that becomes available. The COP27 coalition is calling on civil society organizations and activists to mobilize and organize decentralized actions in their cities and towns and communities all across the world on Saturday, the 12th of November. So that's the middle weekend of, um, of COP27. And obviously with the restrictions on protests in Egypt, it becomes more important than ever that we do this uh, decentralized mobilization around the world for climate justice and human rights. The coalition is also calling for decentralized people's forums throughout the duration of COP27 to highlight the voices of people on the ground. Again, you can visit their website, which Becky has shared a link to in the chat and follow them on social media as well. Um, this event is being organized from the UK. So I'd also like to add that for those of you who are based in the UK, the Climate Justice Coalition, which was formerly the COP26 coalition, will be mobilizing for this global day of action on the 12th of November and mobilizations have all already been called for London, Edinburgh, Newcastle and Plymouth. 
um, as well as by the Irish Climate Justice Coalition in Derry and Belfast, um, and with many more expected to come in the coming weeks. You can find out how to support and get involved with these online uh, on the COP, well, it, it says COP26 coalition, but really it's the Climate Justice Coalition now um, website there. And finally, for those of you who will be in Egypt for COP27 and who can potentially stay on for a little afterwards, Global Justice Now, together with Transform Europe, are organizing with Egyptian trade unions, women's organizations and opposition parties, organizing an, an event um, in Cairo on November the 20th to 22nd. And there will be a formal call to attend and co-organize events and programs and speakers, et cetera, soon. We don't have details to share of any website or any more on that just now, but I can say watch this space as in um, the COP20, uh, the, the Climate Justice Coalition spaces um, for more information when that becomes available. So I'm gonna stop there and that was a lot, but please just copy the bits and pieces out of the chat if you didn't manage to capture that all. We've also been tweeting these calls to action from the Friends of the Earth Scotland um, Twitter account as well. So you can look there as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mary, for that. Um, I'd like to uh, just close by uh, first thanking everyone who joined us as an attendee. Um, thanks for tuning in from wherever you've uh, done so. I hope you found this um, as informative as I have. I'd like to thank, of course, our speakers, uh, Dipti Bhatnagar and Omar Robert Hamilton for taking the time to be with us today and sharing their knowledge and their expertise. Um, and I'd also like to close again by thanking our hosts, Friends of the Earth Scotland, the Climate Justice Coalition and Stop Climate Chaos Scotland. Thanks everyone and have a good evening. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, bye-bye. Okay.